Hello, welcome to the EPG Pathshala program in linguistics. I am Pramod Pandey, Center for Linguistics, Jawaharlal Nehru University. Now we will discuss the module entitled Intonation 2 from the course Introduction to Phonetics and Phonology. We have already looked at the first part of the topic of intonation in the last module where we discussed mainly the interaction between rhythm and intonation. In this module, we will focus on intonation, the main aspects of intonation, of an intonational contour, and the grammatical functions of intonation. So the phon phonology of intonation, the most important part of intonation is, as we said, a tone group and within the tone group the most important part is the nucleus. It is the nucleus which determines what type of tone is used. Now the type of tone used is called the nuclear tone. These are of various types in languages but four main types are prominent and they are used for expressing grammatical meanings. As you see them on the screen, we have falling, rising, falling, rising, and rising, falling. Let's take an example of a single word which is said with these four different nuclear tones. Falling, John. For example, in answer to the question, what's your name? Rising, John. As a question meaning, is your name John? Falling, rising. John, as an important meaning of, of course my name is John. You know it. This is one of the meanings. You can have other meanings as well. Rising, falling. Something like John, as a surprise, seeing John unexpectedly. So these are the four main types, and they have schematic representations on the screen. As you see it, we have the falling tone, Rising, falling starts high and then comes down. Rising starts low, goes up. Fall rise again is starting high, coming low, go up. Now on the screen, on the spectrogram, you will notice that the pitch actually shows that kind of change. Of course, it is less dramatic than here. Now these uh, <clears throat> tones can show early or late um, nucleus, nuclear uh, use. For example, we can have a fall coming very early in a sentence. Now, when that is the case, then we have something like, let's use the terms themselves, something like early fall and late fall. So both are falling tones. But in one case, the fall takes place early in the utterance, like early fall. So you go on, early fall. And then you say, late fall, late fall. So that's a late fall kind of example. And so let me say them. The coffee was excellent. It was an exceptional feat. They have declared today as a holiday. As you notice that the last stressed item, all these are content words. That is what bears the nucleus. Nucleus. Examples of rising nuclei. Let me say these ones too. The coffee was excellent. It was an exceptional feat. They have declared today as a holiday. Now, all these sentences said with a rising tone have different meanings from the meanings of them said with a falling tone. Now, when we describe uh, an international unit, then one of the ways in which we do it is the way the standard British um, school of the study of intonation did it. We have four different parts of an international unit. The nucleus of an international unit is something that must be there, which means essentially that you can have an international unit of a single word, 
For example, John. I say, in answer to a question, what's his name? We say, John. Or what's your name? We say, John. So a single word has a tone. The tone you notice is the following tone. And to repeat, I can say, John. I say, what did you say? Did you say John, etc.? So when a single word is has uh, is said <coughs> with the nucleus, and that's the only part of an international unit, you have the nucleus. But we notice that uh, nu a nuclear, a, a tonal international unit have has other parts as well, and these are exemplified on the screen for us. So in the first sentence. The coffee was excellent. We have the nucleus, an excellent. First, the stress syllable. And then the other parts are shown here. Essentially, they are to be defined thus. The head is the stretch from the first stress to the nuclear stress. So the first stress in that sentence is ka. And the excellent is the ek is the nuclear tone. If there is a syllable or a stretch of syllables, then that is said to be the tail of the international unit. And if there is a stretch that is unstressed before the first first stress syllable, then that is known as the pre-head uh, part of the international unit. So thus, we have a very long uh, prehead in the sentence. It was an exceptional feat, or they have they have, de they have declared today as a holiday. Now, if it is the nucleus falls on today, you know, say they have declared today as a holiday, even though there is stress. But if today is the nuclear, on account of focus or whatever, then the entire stretch is considered to be. A tail. Another approach to the description of an international contour is known as pitch curve. Now, in this approach, the international contour is represented in terms of the of the typography. So, let's say the nucleus is typed as in capital letters, and then notice the symbol before always and before father. That stands for a minor pause. And then we have a single slash line that stands for a pause. And that's how. But Ramesh has always been very close to his father. So the slight pauses uh, are the ones which are represented in the description of the pitch curve of the sentence as an example. Now we'll turn to discuss the functions of intonation. That's where the prosody is very important in interpreting utterances. One of, the most, uh, one of the most important aspects of the study of intonation is how it expresses different meanings grammatically. Please remember that all the prosodic features such as stress, tone, and intonation, all of them can express multiple meanings in different contexts in open context. However, <clears throat> those cannot be discussed in, within the bounds of a classroom because they are unlimited. The con contexts are unlimited. Uh, we can only talk about those functions which are grammatically conditioned. And that's how we are going to talk about the functions of intonation. We have to resort to examples from English because this is the language which has been the best studied for intonation as for many other areas. The use of falling tone in English is specifically for these four types of sentences. Those which stand for statements and question types using WH word, commands, and exclamations. So let, let's uh, say them as statements. His father is a farmer. Notice when I say farmer is the stress, is the, is the falling tone. His father is a farmer. If I have to um, 
prolong, sort of extend the duration of farmer, then you will hear the following tone more clearly. His father is a farmer, farmer. That's how I say, but it said very quickly in less uh, duration. <coughs> and then the second sentence, they have finished their meals. They have finished their meals. Again, is just a statement that they have finished their meals. What meaning can we give to it? The meaning is there in the sentence itself. Nothing else needs to be added. Then we also have question type sentences beginning with WH word. So you know that we distinguish between questions as WH type questions and yes, no type questions or polarity questions, which require an answer in yes and no. Of these two, only WH type questions are said with a, with a falling tone as grammatically acceptable. For example, when we say, where is the post office? It's perfectly acceptable as a sentence. So we, when we use a, a sentence, use, when we say a sentence using which, who, whom, where, when, and how, these words, we can say them with a falling tone. The third type of sentence, which is said with a falling tone, is commands. Thus, <clears throat> this is uh, restricted to interlocutors who hold the relation between someone who can command and someone who carries out the command or order, such as, for example, a high officer or uh, in old days, not today, a school teacher, for example. So the sentence said with a command, such as, bring the file, bring the file. It's said with a falling tone, open the door, open the door. It's said with a falling tone. Exclamations is another type of sentence which is said with a falling tone. Here, of course, the fall is steep, from very high to low, rather than from mid-high to low. For example, beautiful, very tough. So you go from high and then go low, but the basic contour of the tone is a falling tone. Now, rising tones in English. We have to we, uh, look at the meanings conveyed by rising tone in relation to the falling tone. The rising tone is typically used for yes-no questions. To give an example, we say, are we meeting tomorrow? Are we meeting tomorrow? Now, notice, if we say it with a falling tone, then we will sound extremely rude. So if I say it, are we meeting tomorrow? This is unacceptable in a language such as English, but that's not a universal phenomenon. There are languages such as um, Malayalam, for example, which is known to have falling tone for most question types. <clears throat> Actually, Malayalam has very restricted rising tones. Languages, thus, are also distinguished on the basis of the typical types of nuclear tones used in them. In, it, in <coughs> addition to Malayalam, Meitei has been found to have a lot of falling tone, where we use a rising tone, etc. Coming back to English, the rising tone is also used for WH questions when they are asked warmly. For example, when you are talking to a child or to an old man or you want to sound polite, then you will say, what's your name? Where is the post office? This sounds polite but perfectly acceptable. Then the a contrast between falling tones and rising tones the same sentence which is said as a command, for example, shut the door, can be said as a polite request if we use a rising tone in place of falling tone, such as shut the door, bring the file. Now, when we say these 
these sentences using right in tone, the sentences are no more commands. They are, they are considered to be polite requests. Notice that there's nothing in the written sentence to distinguish the, the, between commands and requests. It's only through speech that, given these words, we can express them, say them as either commands or requests. In writing, we will have to add additional words to express uh, you know, polite request and command, etc. And then incomplete utterances. As you know, it's in the nature of speech that you say a part of a sentence and then you go on to say another part. Suppose your whole uh, an utterance is not complete, then how do you how do you suggest it to the listener that it is not complete? Use rising tone. So a lot of um, speakers, and this seems to be a general universal phenomenon, that more often than not, a rising tone is used for incomplete utterances, such as, while crossing the road, I saw John. While crossing the road, I saw John. The whole sentence is, I saw John while crossing the, crossing the road. We say, while crossing the road, I say it with a rising tone. <clears throat> don't uh, don't uh, think that I've completed the sentence. I'm going to say something after this. And so the first part will be said with a rising tone. And then we have a falling tone. Falling tone is also used here to express finality. And this is expressed especially when we represent lists, for example, one, two, three, four. See, so one, two, three, all this is, shows continuation. I have not finished yet, but the moment I say four, falling tone, that means I have completed what I had to say. So <laughs> these are grammatically conditioned. As you can easily see, nobody will think that the meaning of four, four is, hold on, I am going to say something else. One, two, three, four. If I have to continue, I won't say four. I will say one, two, three, four, etc. Now that's easy to infer. But <clears throat> let me repeat, a lot of meanings of utterances is conveyed in speech in ways that's not available in writing. Now, falling rising tones, as we said earlier when we were talking about early fall and late fall, we also said that uh, falling rising tones can be also divided like that. Now, we have thus two types of falling rising tone, those uh, which are undivided fall rise, so they take place at one place, for example, good, and the other is a divided fall rise, for example, when you say, how was it yesterday? You say, the party was good. You're talking about the party being good, but the other things in the day was not so, were not so good. So this is where divided fall rise can be used. Uh, notice that it's not necessary for us to express divided fall rise, to use divided fall rise. If for the same sentence, I can say it with an undivided fall rise. The party was good to have expressed the same meaning that was expressed for the other sentence. So <clears throat> that's the use of the falling rising intonation. We already said that uh, rising falling intonation is mainly used for exclamations, for showing great surprise, etc. But these four types of nuclear tones have, in, the, in fact, been found to be used in uh, a majority of languages. Some phoneticians, for example, Michael Halliday, have proposed a much larger number of nuclear tones used in, used in English. However, for the purpose of learning and teaching a language, it is not necessary to be able to familiar with all types of tones because they are not grammatically um, determined. They do not depend upon the grammatical structure, rather on the context. And as we said, 
context is infinite. <laughs> you can never bring all the context together on a piece of paper. So we can't really discuss the importance of uh, different types of context and it's their bearing on the international contour of a sentence. So we have come to the close of the discussion of intonation. <coughs> we discuss them in these two modules. Hopefully you'll be able to see how intonation was <coughs> discussed and studied in structural phonology. We'll return to this topic in the course on advanced phonology where new perspectives have been brought in to find an explanation of the phenomenon of intonation. Thank you.